So this morning we're going to do a song. Um, it's actually one that Jeff and Cheryl introduced to us a couple weeks ago. And I, I just love this song because it, it talks about how when Jesus was born, the shepherds and the angels declared who he was. And then when he went to the cross and he died for our sins, there was an empty tomb that proved who he was. And then it comes back to us as believers. What is our responsibility and where, how do we fit in in declaring who Jesus is? And that's what we're going to sing this morning is Jesus saves. We're going to talk about who Jesus is and we declare to the world that Jesus saves. So if you would stand, let's sing that song. Corinthians chapter 11, 
Take a look with me at verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is being broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In fact, that's the title of our message today, in remembrance of me. Uh, Let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, as we come into your, as actually we continue in your presence today, I just want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. I'm so grateful for those who have led us thus far in worship today to help bring us before the throne of grace. And as we arrive now at the time of the preaching of the Word of God, our focus today is to remember the Lord Jesus and what he did on the cross. And we will do this in the message today, Father, and also in the Lord's Supper right after the morning service. And so I pray that you would speak to us today. We desperately desire and need to hear from heaven. And so I pray that as a result of our time together with you in the word, that we will have grown in our intimacy with you, that we will become more like Jesus, and that we can emerge from the four walls of this building having victory today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. In remembrance of Jesus, uh, how many of you have ever heard of the great missionary to Africa named David Livingston? You ever heard of him? Uh, While we were on vacation last year, I had the opportunity to read a good uh, biography on David Livingston, and I came across a statement that he made. Uh, He had no idea how popular he had become in England. Uh, People were always coming up to him at various times and talking about the sacrifice that he made for the Lord. And here's what he had to say about that. He said, people talk about the sacrifice that I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called a sacrifice which is simply paid back a small part of the great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings its own reward of helpful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with such a word, away with such a view and such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then, with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life, may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and sink, but let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall hereafter be revealed in us and for us. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk when we remember the great sacrifice which he made who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. Well said. Amen. There is nothing that we can endure in this life that we can genuinely call sacrifice whenever we think about the love and sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made out of his great love for us. In a few minutes, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And oftentimes, as Christians, we treat this like it's a ritual or something that we do every three months to check off of our to-do list as a church, that's not what the Lord's table is all about. Today I want us to truly remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross by meditating on what he said while hanging on it. We're going to come back to the cross today, and we're going to remember the body that was broken, so that as we remember, we will be broken as well. And through brokenness, God will give us victory. So, as we begin today, Jesus is led, and you don't have to turn to these passages because they'll be up on the screen for you. We begin today as Jesus is led to Golgotha around 9 o'clock in the morning. They offer him our our narcotic to dull the pain, but Jesus refuses it because he wants to be totally aware of what he says and does. 
and they crucify him actually between two robbers. He was stripped naked of his clothes. He laid himself down on a cross beam. He had iron spikes driven through his hands. His feet were placed one atop the other, and the longer spike was driven through both feet into the wood. And under his feet was a support so that he could push up on that to breathe. His arms were tied to the cross beam, and he was attached to the tree and crucified. And he hung there, suspended between heaven and hell, his feet just a few feet off the ground. This, in short, is the process of crucifixion, which was reserved actually for the most terrible criminals. Uh, in fact, the Romans wouldn't even crucify their own. They would only crucify slaves or foreigners. It was a torture. And as Jesus is lifted up, he looks through blood-soaked eyes at his murderers, and he makes the first statement. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. After this come the insults. He was insulted by those who passed by, by those who just stood there gawking at him. The religious leaders, as well as the passerbys, would hurl insults at him. They said, come down from the cross if you truly are the Son of God, and then we'll believe in you. The religious leaders were outraged already because of the sign with his accusation written on top of the cross. Pilate showed his contempt for them by having that accusation signed, placed in all three languages of their world so that everyone who saw would see the charge, Jesus, King of the Jews. They thought that him being crucified would be the insult, but Pilate reverses everything and points the insult back on them. The soldiers join in the mockery and the insults as well as the two robbers the Word of God says, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. And then something interesting happens. While everyone is there, and they're gawking, and they're hurling insults at Jesus, especially after he makes this statement, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they do. You have the two robbers, one crucified on either side. They are both hurling insults at Jesus, along with everyone else, even though they're dying. But one of the robbers had a change of heart. The Bible says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, then save yourself and save us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then our Lord makes his second statement from the cross. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Verse 42. You know, this is a beautiful picture as we take a look at the word of God together today. Jesus saw into this man's heart. Jesus had a divine appointment with this man 10 trillion years ago that had been established by the Father. He knew that this man believed in him despite all the others mocking. By the way, this man is the only one there among those who had been hurling insults that actually made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. That would take a lot of faith, especially in the midst of such mockery. This Jewish rebel recognized Jesus as the Messiah. He knew that he was going to die. It was just a matter of hours. And he did not know where he was going to go. Do you see the picture? His life is over. You see, when that cross was finished with him, he was going to be dead. And it was just a matter of time. Jesus knew what the man was thinking. And he assured him, he said, you will see me this very day in paradise, the place of blessing for believers. Now, 
About two hours have passed since Jesus was nailed to the cross after Pilate had pronounced sentence against Jesus. Uh, John, the apostle, leaves the scene and he goes and gets some of the others. The rest of the men were all cowards. They would not come. But some of the women came. Among them, Mary, Jesus' mother, was there. Mary, the wife of Clopas, was there. And Mary Magdala. And they gather around the cross, and then Jesus speaks again in his third statement. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, of course, that's John, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Let me ask you a question. Jesus had younger brothers, younger half-brothers. Why didn't he have them take care of his mother? Doesn't it seem natural that the next oldest would be the one that would take care of Mary? Jesus didn't want that. He didn't want an unbeliever taking care of his mother. And all of his brothers, including uh, Jude and James, were both unbelievers at this time. They did not place faith in Christ as Savior until Jesus had risen from the dead. And so... Jesus takes the woman that meant most to him in this world, that he wanted to see taken care of, and he puts, he puts her into the custody of the disciple that he was arguably closest to. John always referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved, and he experienced such an intimacy with the Lord that uh, when they were reclining at the table, he placed his head gently up against Jesus' breast. Simeon had made a prophecy concerning Mary, and she needed John in that moment. Here's what he said at the time that Jesus was an infant. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for its sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That prophecy that Simeon had made concerning Mary and concerning the Lord Jesus, this was the time. Can you imagine how she felt as she saw her son crucified, knowing who he was and not understanding everything, but trying to grasp all of this in that moment and still hold on to her faith? John takes her to his home. The first three statements that Jesus makes from the cross focused on others. His murderers, the thief being crucified next to him, and his mother Mary. The next statement is focused on the Father. At this point, all the land is covered in darkness from noon until about 3 o'clock p.m. J. Dwight Pentecost, one of my heroes, said, quote, it was as though nature itself were cognizant of the suffering of its creator. All the land had grown dark. And in the midst of that darkness, Jesus spoke again. And he makes his fourth statement. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's very crucial that you and I understand exactly what is going on in this moment. This is something that we've pointed out several times before. Whenever we focus in on Jesus being crucified, we tend to focus in on the torture and the blood and the agony of crucifixion. I want to tell you something. As bad as that is, it did not compare at all to the spiritual suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because understand that from eternity past, God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, always won, always together. But in this time where darkness covered the land, God the Father separated Himself from Jesus for the first time in eternity. And that is when all of God's wrath was poured onto his son 
and God the Father would not acknowledge him. He separated himself from him. He turned his back on him so that Jesus is left all alone for the first time ever, suffering the wrath of God. He took the blow, and it was all poured out onto him. The Bible says that he was cursed in that moment. And because he is all alone, suffering your hell, every bit of the hell that you should have suffered in all eternity was poured onto him in that moment. And that's why in agony he cries out, not only physical agony, but emotional agony. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is what we remember today. That is what we honor in the Lord's table is the suffering of the Lord Jesus. Jesus in that moment is giving himself as a ransom for many. He is tasting death for every man. He is drinking down the cup of the wrath of God. He is suffering spiritual death which is separation from God and he will soon suffer physical death, which is the separation of the soul from the body. This is the curse inherited from Father Adam. And at this point, he is made to become a sin offering. That's why there's darkness. That's why there's thirst. That's why there's isolation. And that's why he cries out in complete anguish of soul. He is, in effect, cursed by God and cursed by man. And at this point, John arrives back on the scene after taking Mary away, and he describes what happens next. Statement number five. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. So what was accomplished? We'll talk more about this in a moment, but on the surface, Jesus makes this statement because his throat is parched. And he wants his last statement to be loud and clear. Beneath the surface, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. The sixth statement. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. John 19.30 You see, the whole purpose of Jesus coming into the world had now been accomplished. He was sent on mission by the Father to buy you back from the slave market of sin. He fulfilled the law perfectly. He fulfilled every single prophecy related to his first coming. It had to be done, all of it, down to the final detail. Matthew tells us that Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and John tells us what he said. It is finished. Jesus paid it all. In fact, this phrase was used in Greek commercial life, and it signifies a completed action by the full payment of a price. It is accomplished. It has been done, Jesus said. And the price for your redemption and mine was paid. All sin that I commit, all sin that you commit, results in a debt that has to be discharged before you can be accepted by God. For years, within the Jewish system, sacrifices were made in anticipation of the Lamb of God that would take upon himself the sins of the world. When Christ died, he took all of the accumulated debt of the whole sinful race, and he offered himself to God as a payment for sin. The Bible says, whom God set forth as a propitiation, a satisfaction by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. The verse says that Jesus gave up He yielded up his spirit. Literally, it means that he handed over his spirit. 
It's the idea. He had already said, nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. He said, I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This commandment I have received from my Father. And then he makes his final statement. Number seven. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. See, Jesus came into this world at his Father's will. He obeyed the law of God perfectly because of his Father's will. And now he entrusts his spirit to his Father that he has listened to and obeyed his entire earthly existence. He bowed his head and he literally dismissed his soul from his body. And in so doing, we find that the last three statements that Jesus made focused in on himself, his body, his soul, and his spirit. And that is what we are called to remember today. The greatest sacrifice that this world has ever known. And I want to ask you a question. In light of that sacrifice, how have you responded? Whenever you know that someone loves you infinitely, how do you react to that? When someone was willing to pay the price that you could never pay, and offers you a gift called salvation. It's the forgiveness of your sins. It is what will allow you to become a brand new creation in Christ and ultimately to go to heaven to be with God. Are you willing to accept that free gift of God's salvation? Are you willing to say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for all of them. And I thank you for loving me and doing for me what I could never do. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you rose victorious from the grave. And I know that you're offering me this gift, this salvation. I accept that. I want that. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Savior. There's nothing I can do about my past, but everything that I am I give to you. You can have my future. If that's you, and that's what you want, then ask Jesus to save you today, and he will. And if you have any questions about that, I've got all day, and I'll sit down with you, and I'll show you from the Word of God. I'll, I'll guide you through that process of you becoming a Christian. For the rest of us, if we're not careful, this good news can become something that we get used to. Never get used to it. Never let it grow old. It's, it's never gotten old with me. Maybe it's because I was a little bit older whenever I got saved and I, I know what I was delivered from. But I've never forgotten. And by the grace of God, every single day that I live, I live in light of the fact that I am completely known and completely loved and completely forgiven. And I get to spend the rest of eternity, praising him for his indescribable gift. Let's remember today the matchless love that no one besides Jesus could ever have or has ever had for you. You remember hearing about a guy named Colonel William Travis? Colonel William Travis. He faced the... Uh, and battled defenders of the Alamo. And he said, men, the Mexican dictator, General Santa Ana, has demanded our surrender. But this fort is essential to the defense of Texas. 
My orders are to hold it, and there's no help coming to reinforce us. The Mexican army is about 5,000 strong. Then as the 232 American soldiers watched, Colonel Travis drew a line in the dirt floor with his sword. He said, any man who wants to escape is free to go now. Any who are determined to stay and die in defense of the Alamo will cross this line. Davy Crockett boldly stepped across the line. Others followed. And finally, only James uh, Bowie, who made the Bowie knife famous, was left and he was too ill to move by his own strength. He asked to be carried across, and he was. Colonel Travis sent the fateful message, we refuse to surrender. The Mexicans attacked on March the 6th, 1838. It took three assaults for them to overpower the force, the fort by sheer mass of numbers. The Americans fought back grimly and fiercely, but inevitably they all lay dead. When news of their bravery leaked to the American forces, the defenders were inspired to advance. General Sam Houston gave the battle cry, quote, victory is certain, remember the Alamo. And the motto fired the men on to victory over the Mexican army. The sacrifice of those 232 soldiers inspired others to a great victory. But I want you to understand something. As moving as that is to read and to hear, as we take a look back at history, as moving as it is, today we remember a better and a more noble sacrifice, infinitely better, provided by Jesus Christ, not in Texas, but on a hill called Calvary. Today we remember and celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ and his victory over sin and death and hell and the grave. You know what we need to do? As we remember the Lord Jesus. And we, we do this in remembrance of Him. We need to do so with a clean and a thankful heart. Amen? We need to do it with joy on our lips and an excitement for the future that awaits. Because as we come to the Lord's table, we not only remember His sacrifice, but we also look forward to His coming. Right, Gina? Gina? Let's draw close to him this morning, completely, with nothing in between. Let's pray together. P. Jeff, could you come and play for just a couple minutes? As Pastor Jeff comes to play, we are told that we need to examine ourselves. That we need to examine ourselves to see where we are. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and then so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if there's anyone who needs to uh, leave at this point because you don't feel like you're in a position to celebrate the Lord's table, then you can quietly get up right now and uh, just quietly dismiss yourself. No one's looking around. But for those who want to partake of the Lord's table today, we have briefly gone through the seven final statements of our Lord Jesus that he made while hanging on the cross. And as we've done so, we've been reminded of the sacrifice. Father, if there's anyone who has sin in their heart, they need to confess that right now so that they can be clean as we celebrate Jesus' victory together. So I pray that they would spend a couple of moments with you. Whatever it is that could be holding them back today, I pray that they would get that settled. Help them to be clean. Help all of us to be clean so that we can do this together as one.
body in Christ and to do so with joy. So we pray, Lord, as we obey your command, it is such an honor to do so. I pray that you would move in our hearts, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit of God, and that you would bless us together corporately.